Hello, I'm Jay. And I'm Dick. And this is Bad Science Fiction Read Poorly, the podcast where we choose a whole bunch of random things, and then we take those things and we write science fiction over the course of four hours, we read it on the first go, and, well, talk about it. Anyway, uh, if you like Bad Science Fiction Read Poorly, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you hear our show. If you would like to leave us a message for our, for our show, you can find us at anchor.fm slash bsfrp. We might even read it on the air. All right. Now, Dick. So. Yes. What are we doing today? Well, Jay, if you remember on last week's episode, we got into a weird discussion about colony collapse. So we thought that uh, today's theme should be something about colonies. And also, since our last episode, all over the news, people have been talking about these murderous hornets that, that came from Asia that are going to be attacking everybody and murdering everybody this year, as if this year couldn't get any stranger. So why not talk about colonies as a, as a unifying theme for this, for this episode? All right. I like it. I like it. So today's, I mean, I was thinking about robots maybe, but, uh, you know, we did talk about it last time being a, the theme and I kind of want to stay true to, well, what we recorded on the air, uh, last week. So Ooh, robots, I don't know. I kind of like, we can always well, do we robots can rope that in. We can always do robots for the next. Okay. Or, or if we, we can do robot colonies. Or, or if independently we decide to rope in robots, that would be... Ro- robo, robo colony. I mean, maybe. We're getting Ro- a little oddly do specific. We, okay, so do we want to write a science fiction about robot colonies? That could be... I mean, maybe. We could do it. Or... Or we can just keep it separate, and if we choose to have a robot colony, we can. But it has to be something to do with a colony. It has to be something to do with robots. I like this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then maybe I guess next time then or next week, perhaps we just do yeah. a robot themed show. Yeah, we can figure out something else for next week. So how about this? So we have three items that we normally discuss. Okay. Well, why don't we just say that? those in those items one of them has to be have to do with colonies okay An, another one another one is robots okay robots and let's just uh, instead of picking three let's have two this week that we okay. actually draw from all right so we'll, so that'll so be we'll have the a year total of four items so that'd be the year and the genre then so oh, oh no we do the year we do the genre and then the two items oh okay we'll have i see what you're saying four items yeah, we'll have four items, two of them being colonies, robots, and then we'll draw two. Okay. That, that'll be nice. So, robo colonies. Okay, so robot And if we want to talk about bees, space bees, we can do that. I, I, I might just throw that in if I want to. Oh, we'll, we'll, we'll see what we're going to be writing about. So, anyway. All right, just make, trying to keep us on track here. So, all right. So, Dick, are we going to... Yes. Shall we just go ahead and uh, pull your numbers first? Would you like to go All first? All right. I would love to go first. So what All number right, is mine? Hit me. 4997. Gonna party like it's 4,997. Yeah, that, that's almost the fifth millennia. Almost. Okay. Uh, one second. Just trying to organize everything here. All right. So, the next number is 6952. 6952. What's the difference between the 5th millennia and the 7th millennia? Eh, okay. Let's let's come up with the interesting third one. Okay. I think I'm going towards 4997. It has a nice ring to it. Yeah, I I was actually kind of thinking about that, yeah. 7630. 76.30. Now, nah, let's do the first one. 59.97. I like it. You mean 4.997. Like I said, 4.997. <laughs> By the way, did I say have a really bad short-term memory? <laughs> uh, well, hey, you know, hey, in previous episodes, haven't we figured out that we both do? <laughs> so what I found really interesting doing the edits for last week's episode, I accidentally renamed my own character 
my my female lead several times. I kept on going back and forth between Jill and Jane. Oh. I feel really bad about that. And then on top of that, I, I started yeah. I started changing Jay's female lead to mispronouncing her name several hundred times, which I did call out. <laughs> but it's fine. It is what it is, right? It is what it is. So, all right, so let's go on to your genre. All right, I'm really looking forward to a genre. All right, what do I have? Fantasy. Fantasy. I like it. Okay, I can do a, you know, a futuristic fantasy. Fantasy, to me, a future fantasy is going to be more like Star Wars because it's like a space fantasy and there really isn't like science fiction in it. It's just all kind of magic. Mumbo yeah, Jumbo it's got style. space wizards. Yeah. Space wizards. Yeah. All right. Uh, space wizards that are also space knights as well. I mean, that apparently yeah. have like mitochlorian in their... Like, why don't you just get a mitochlorian injection? That's what I haven't figured out. If you just wanted, you know, an in vitro test tube Jedi master. Just uh, pump yeah. them up for all those mitochlorians if that's all that it is. Anyway, okay. So what do we have? All right, the next one is Surrealist. A Surrealist Space... Oh, science fiction surrealism. I'm going to have to do some reading up on that. That might be actually kind of fun. Like, is this like avant-garde? Because this is is the writing genre that we're, we're, we're doing. So it's a Surrealist genre. I can do that. I like that. Okay, so quick... You know, internet search. Uh, well, what's going on here? We okay. Surrealism is meant to be strange and shocking, meant to push the envelope in a way that forces people out of their comfort, comfortable ideas. Uh, blah blah blah. Which reminds me of a joke. No. How many Surrealism... surrealists? Do... No. How how many surrealists does it take to change a light bulb? Lion. No. One, to fill the bathtub full of multicolored power tools, and two, to rotate the giraffe. Ah, okay, I got it. <laughs> so, Jeez, so, thanks, uh, thanks for ruining my joke. <laughs> All right. Don't worry. Okay, yeah. so sur- surrealism. literary surrealism, not Salvador Dali paintings. I mean, if you wanted to try your hand at that, you just have to write it would be hard to. It w- yeah. It would be hard to write a Salvador Dali painting. I mean, I don't know. Somebody had to script. I mean, somebody had to script his Alka Seltzer commercial from the seventies. <laughs> all right. So, what is surrealist <laughs> literature? Anyway, all right. Surrealism in literature can be defined as an artistic attempt to bridge together reality and the imagination. So, in other words, fiction. <laughs> uh, I think. I think more. I think the imagination. I think what they mean by imagination is not like imagination, as in like. I imagine a building, like I imagine the Empire State Building. I think it's more like a Seussian sort of imagination, perhaps, or something else like that. I mean, I don't know. I'm just going to give you that one sentence, and uh, we're just not going to deal with that too much. You see, now that it seems so much harder or challenging or interesting, it makes me want to do it that much more. I mean, you, you could definitely, I mean, you know, hypothetically, if you wanted to, you could literally have somebody land on a, on a, on a colony that is basically, you know, just L- limp clocks and giraffes with really, really long legs. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, baseball and lobster phones. You are going to absolutely hate what I'm going to write. If uh, I, I do can't surrealist. Hear you, you're you're gonna absolutely hate what I'm gonna write if I pick this one. It's gonna be wonderful. The third genre is monster. Monster genre. So a monster. Okay. Monster of the week. There we go. Phone it into lowest common denominator. Yeah, it's settled. I'm gonna do surrealist. Okay, buddy. And it has to be shocking. So. The beauty of this one is, whatever I write, you're going to have to read on the air. <laughs> uh, first off, <laughs> no. <laughs> Second off, oh, I mean, yes, but within reason. You know what I mean. We've, we have already 
We've already discussed Technically, the limits. We're checking off the "this is a kids show" button on 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 the the on air distributors. So we need to make sure that it's actually a kids show. Yeah, we yeah. So, okay. so you can have your kids in the car and listen to this podcast. <laughs> That's what we're trying to do, anyway. So they'll be like. Mommy, Daddy, who are those really annoying people on the radio? <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, son. That's not the radio. <laughs> don't Yeah, don't worry. It's not the radio, and don't worry. <laughs> no, you don't need to listen to them anyway. They're just weird. <laughs> All, All right. right. So I'm going to give you three items, and you have to choose two. Okay? Three items, and I get to pick two. All right. All right. We're going to do that again. Why are we going to do it again? Because I want to. I don't know. I'm going to be doing Surrealist, so you, you can't ruin the cycle. Oh, come on. All right, which which three did you draw? <laughs> Read them out. Uh, Canon cameras of different models. Specifically Canon cameras. Yeah, I know, right? All right, well, in a Surrealist world, I can take that and run with it. Okay. Yes, you can. A plush teddy bear. A plush teddy bear. Okay. And Windward. that could be teddy bear... The verb or teddy bear the noun? A plush teddy bear. Okay, fine. All right, a plush teddy bear. And that looks, it says windward on the roof, but it's a wind wind sill, right? Or something like that? Wind what vane? Called? A wind vane, yes. There we go. I was like, uh, welcome, to, okay. welcome to bad science fiction read poorly roof. where we just make up words. Anyway. Yeah, make up words that don't exist and then mispronounce them horribly yeah. And not realize it until the third edit. All right. Absolutely. So I'm going to pick Canon, Canon cameras of different models and a plush teddy bear. I will do that in my surrealist space science fiction novel. Okay. So, wait, so which two? The Canon cameras? The Canon cameras of different models. And a plush teddy bear. A plush teddy bear. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and let's start reading. You know, it's time for you to read my numbers. All right. Are you ready for this? All right, no, Jay. No, but your, uh, here we go. Your first number is 7,215. I think our random number generator really likes the uh, the seven thousands today. All right, yep. your second number to pick from is five thousand four hundred and ninety-five. This seems like the worst episode of Price is Right ever. It's it's yeah. I don't know. Let's let's let's, let's amp it up here. So, out of those two, which one would you would you go for? Are you more in the sevens or the fives? I was thinking more of the fives. All right. Okay. Let's hit it one last one, and let's find out. 4,244. Uh, let's go with 4244. I like that. 4244. All right. So, so we're, we're both, both in the going same millennia. Solidly in the fourth millennia. Mine is just right on the tail end. All right. Now let's look at our, our genre. Okay. Let's pick which th- which of these genres yours is going to be. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. A dark comedy. Okay. I'm going to love it. What do you think about a, a dark comedy? I mean, I mean, that might be my favorite. Okay. I'm looking forward to that one. The other option is a slasher. A slasher novel or slasher short story, which you can also do as a dark comedy, which would be hilarious. Yeah. I mean, actually, yeah. You got some ideas. I see your oh, face. Okay. Oh, I've, I've got an idea. And yes. to hopefully ruin your idea, here's your third one you can pick from, the epic Western. Because I know last week you wanted to write a Western. You even gave me a Western, uh, uh, oh, what's that thing that people say? Catchphrase. What, what is it? Catchphrase. Oh, catchphrase. Yeah, last week Isn't you gave me the Isn't that the title the of the phrase. episode? Yeah, it's the title of the episode. <laughs> And, and just... hey, you, you assume I remember things when you tell me this. I, yeah, that's true. This, this that's conversation true. we need to have. I don't remember things. It's just the thing you need to understand about me. Anyway, so uh, you gave me the Western catchphrase, and and I drew Western. So you wanted to write a Western, too, so you're all Westerned up. So which one are you going to pick? I'm going to think I'm going to 
I think I'm gonna make an illusion here. I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna try for a dark comedy slasher. All right. Yeah. This is. This will be fun with robots and space colonies and these other two objects. Yes. Let's uh, get it all ready here and draw these out of the hat. So we'll draw three. You pick two. And here we go. Choice number one. I don't even... Fine cosmetic brush? You know, like, you I totally guess you're applying murder. rouge or something like that. You totally have to murder somebody with a fine cosmetic brush. Okay, that's one. Now yep. the next one is a delicate and warm table lamp. So I'm guessing that the temperature of the bulb is like 2,500 Kelvin. What do they mean by warm? Well, uh, I mean, maybe they're talking about in the light spectrum. Or it's a heat lamp. Could be. That breaks very easily. I don't know. Whichever one you want to pick. So a fine cosmetic brush, a delicate and warm table lamp, or a household kitchen knife. Oh. And that. <laughs> I, you know, sometimes... Sometimes so, things yeah, just sometimes line the universe up. Is just un- <laughs> yeah. The universe is unfolding this one for you. So what Dick, two are you going to pick? The universe is speaking to me. <laughs> A fine cosmetic brush and... Yeah, yeah I'm going to pick the fine cosmetic brush and the... Household kitchen knife. Kinefe. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like, uh, I, I tried to, I, I totally forgot for a split second that uh, knife started with a K. Because, uh, you know, it's not, you know, we're maybe it should be like bad, bad spellers reading bad science fiction read poorly. Hey, I'm not a bad speller. Oh, I was making fun of myself. I'm, I, why would, why <laughs> would you read into that for you? Because I'm very defensive about my spelling because uh, I am very bad at, at typing things in on a cell phone. And you wouldn't believe some of the things I've told people over, over the years. Anyway, so that's, we that's have another our that's items. another podcast for a whole other day. Oh man, how to unintentionally offend people by accidentally sending them the wrong text? It's very easy. All so, right. ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to drink a whole bunch of coffee and get this thing kickstarted. We have four hours. I'm going to write an epic surrealist science fiction novel taking place in the year 4,997. And it's going to involve robots, colonies, space bees, maybe, Canon cameras of different models, and a plush teddy bear. All right. And my choices are, are going to be you know robot colonies, the year 4,244, and it's going to be a dark comedy slasher. And my two objects are going to be the fine cosmetic brush and the household kitchen knife. All right. I'm looking forward to this. And you are going to regret drawing Surrealist for me because I know exactly what I'm going to do. Hopefully our audience won't hate it as much as you will. <laughs> Oh, all no. right, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I will see you in four hours. Bye, All Jay. right, yep, see you all in four hours. Hello, I am Dick. And I'm Jay. And we're back to Bad Science Fiction Read Poorly. So we spent the last four hours writing short stories with the prompts that we selected at the first uh, little part of our episode. And uh, now we're going to do the second half where we read each other's stories at first glance and then we talk about it a little bit. So um, I'm really excited about this week. I was able to flex some muscles I haven't flexed in a while in my creative writing. Um, What what do you say, Jay? Uh, It was definitely interesting. It kind of... I started off being kind of like, oh, but, uh, at, you know, when I ended it, I was kind of like, when I ended the episode, I was kind of like, oh, this is fun. That's so poetic. I started out, oh, and I ended, this is fun. Yep. <laughs> oh, 
Well, I guess that's why my name is Dick. All right, so <laughs> I am ready. I guess this week it's my turn to read yours first. Correct. I'm a little bit excited, and um, I'm trying a new system of reading a touch screen to make it more like I'm actually reading an actual document, so I'm not uh, mumbling and trying to find the right words. Ooh, okay. So trying this brand new thing and i'm really excited so without further ado or do you want to you know talk about colonies or robots let's let's save that for after the stories oh this is going to be an interesting the first episode where we don't actually talk a whole bunch before we talk a whole bunch all right only a working model by jay why will you not comply Who is there? Why will you not comply? Comply! This is three type four V6 points. Sparks flew. Smoke rose. Another robot killed. A shadowy figure stepped back into the darkness, the camera unable to determine who. The robot on screen had repeatedly... The robot on screen had repeated knife gouges. Frayed wires were escaping the torso. Were there any footsteps left at the crime? A digital voice asked in a computer terminal. Yes. They suggest a shoe of some kind. The spacing matches the gait of a human, the terminal replied. Does not compute... There have been humans here in 200 years. Type L377V4.658. There are no known colony members with limbs able to manipulate a human gait, said the terminal. Logic accepted. L-type 377V4.658 replied. Are you able, are you available for a game of chess tonight? Negative L-Type 377-V4.658, replied the terminal. Message received. I am Lenny, he said, turning away from the terminal and rolling away. Its track motor is lightly whirling and doors automatically opening and closing as it zoomed past. Lenny exited the law enforcement hub and onto the street. The air was directionless. Lenny gazed up to see the transparent dome. The stars slowly rotated as the colony spun, left uncorrected as Lenny's kind had no need for crop light cycles. His gaze turned to the sign at the entrance of the main airlock, New Pitcairn, in honor of the overthrow of their human overlords two centuries ago. Humans on this station, Lenny thought, illogical. The street before him was bustling with activity. Robots were selling batteries, hardware upgrades, reactor segments, even games before him. There was a light cacophony of pitter-patter coming from the left. You mean Martha says there are humans on the station? A cold voice asked. Affirmative. Lenny replied. The terminal computer... The terminal computed the aggregate of evidence to suggest the entity who aggressively disabled the Type 3's wiring and logics was bipedal. Did Martha turn you down for chess again? Lenny looked down. Affirmative. Illogical. Ivan, if you ever ask again, then I will magnetize your feet to each other. Ivan looked down and replied. Zero one zero one zero 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 one one zero 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 one zero one one zero one zero 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 one one zero 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 one does not compute binary course not loaded said Lenny ha ha should we activate anti biologic protocol asked Ivan Yes, we must go to Central Command, answered Lenny. The motors whirled, and two robots made their way down the street. 
In the middle of the colony stood a rectangular skyscraper. The building had windows, which was a holdover from their human masters. Post-biological projects were launched for the simplicity and functionality. Lenny and Ivan moved into the building, then the elevator. Ivan and Lenny got out at the top floor, which was an open space with an exception of one robot half-absorbed into the wall with wiring. Lenny and Ivan, what do you require? Command Terminal M Terminal in Law Enforcement Hub has concluded totaling of recent three type executed by bipedal biologic. Request colony wide antibiologic protocol level one. Lenny replied, his blank metallic expression gazing at the terminal command. Permission denied. Insufficient data, replied the command terminal. M terminal has 98% confidence. Appeal, said Ivan. Appeal overridden. Code 15484847. Insufficient data. Command terminal activated the elevator doors. Goodbye. Ivan and Lenny left the building. If there is a biologic, then we must secure it, said Ivan. Whoops. Lenny replied. There is something illogical about our appeal being denied. The conversation was broken up by a radio transmission. Unauthorized disassemble in progress. Three type at 60% processing and declining. Coordinates 10325-4234. Lenny and Ivan whirled off to the scene. The coordinates led to a mansion, one of the places where the biologics the former owners of the colony, would live their lives. Most living spaces from the biologics era were mansions, relying upon robots to serve their human masters. After the overthrow and purge of the biologics in 4040, most were destroyed in favor for more functional buildings and spaces. This mansion, the Swazmore House, was left for historical importance. Identify, respond, comply with command, a voice said, the monotone nature underplaying the dire situation the three type was in. Ivan and Lenny turned the corner. Stairs, said Lenny. You go first. As Ivan's flurry of anacred like fleet feet began to fly up the stairs, Lenny's triangular tracks tried to rotate up the stairs, but to no avail. The stairs were too thin and the rise slightly too steep for Lenny to grip. Lenny watched as Ivan turned the corner. There were continued sounds of wires shorting, digital screeches coming from now malfunctioning voice control circuits. Lenny tried again at the stairs. Three types never had the dignity to be quiet while being disassembled. A voice rang out in the room. A few minutes went by. All Lenny could hear was cold, collected voice and the muffled voice of a biologic. Pitch fluctuated. Volume kept changing. Ivan turned the corner with a biologic, a male human in tow. I didn't do anything, I swear, the man yelled. Humans, Ivan said with disgust. The biologic disassembled the internal board wiring and circuitry of the three type maintaining the house. Implement kitchen knife. Lenny looked at the man, then back to Ivan. Is refurbishing of the three type possible? asked Lenny. Negative, applied Ivan. We will interrogate at the hub. Don't you know who I am? I didn't kill that, a uh, type three or whatever, I swear, the biologic replied. Name is irrelevant. Job is irrelevant. Lenny activated a program titled Enforcement Voice from an ancient set of commands called Colony Law Enforcement Protocol. Unauthorized biologic engaging in unauthorized disassembly of Type 3. Argument is inconsequential. My name is Kenneth. My ship exploded and I drifted into New Pitcrum's mining operations. Only meant to stay until I got rescued. I swear I didn't kill that robot, the biologic pleaded. Can I 
walk to the bio can I can I walk the biologic to the enforcement hub? Lenny asked Ivan. You will impress Martha, I accept, said Ivan. Affirmative, Ivan replied. Martha, what kind of robots are you? Kenneth was very confused. Lenny whirled into the building, keeping Kenneth in front for all his colleagues to see. At the end of the lobby was Martha, where a series of terminals were. The terminals floated and were free to move around the colony. However, most terminals, being unable to manipulate objects, being without appendage, were tasked with providing information and performing vastly complex functions. Without such computations, the robots would be unable to execute orders to keep the colony functioning. One of the terminals floated up to Lenny. Bob, state your purpose. L-Type 377-V4.658, unacceptable protocol, acceptable protocol terminal B, replied Bob. Hey, back off there, Bob. He's trying to impress Martha, Kenneth said sarcastically. Terminal M, Martha, floated around the corner of hallway entering the lobby. L-Type 377-V4.658, what does this biologic mean, asked Martha. Lenny looked down to avoid sensor contact. Yeah, he was blabbing about you the whole way up here. Back me up, Ivan, Kenneth said, starting to push his luck. Lenny activated Subdue Perpetrator in the antiquated section of his hard drive. A bolt of electricity arced across the chain Kenneth's handcuffs were attached to. Kenneth tensed and then fell to the floor. Martha followed Lenny as he dragged the bio biologic to a holding cell, cataloging all elements of the arrest, examining fingerprints. I need more data, said Martha. L-Type 377-V, Lenny, could you brush item, kitchen knife, print scans, one through three, report negative. Lenny whirled away to a set of tools on the wall. Underneath a sign that read Fingerprints, Lenny picked up a cosmetic brush off the wall and returned to Martha. Item, cosmetic brush should be of use, implementing dust for prints, announcing Lenny. Enhanced fingerprint scanning, negative. Thank you, Lenny. Would you like to play chess tonight? asked Martha. Whoa, is that what I think it is? Is this robot dating? Oh, wow, this is rich. Kenneth was groggy, waking up from being stunned and realizing he was in a holding cell. Quiet, Kenneth. Affirmative, Martha. Command, sync evening calendar. Activity, chess match. Lenny's internal calendar linked with Martha's, deciding on an 8.30 for that evening's game. Ivan possessed no gloves at the disassemblies. Both kitchen knives do not process biologics digit signatures. Biologics shoe tread does not match previous disassembly, Martha reported. See, I told you it was a robot, Kenneth exclaimed. The radio chimed in. Unauthorized type 3 disassembly in progress. Stream room video, commanded Lenny. Unable to comply. Execute security override, Martha replied. Execute override does not compute, said Lenny. So, hey, how does this robot dating thing work anyway? <laughs> Kenneth asked. We seek companionship with others to complementary skill sets, Lenny replied. Lenny is a working model. Terminals are processing planning and computing models, said Martha. But, like, why, Martha? How do they assign gen... We do nothing of the sort, Lenny explained. Our names are chosen at random based upon predominant model numbers at random name generators from the central command building. Room 33214... Hey, 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 I get it. I don't need to extract coordinates or anything, Kenneth interrupted. The command override was from the command terminal, began Martha. Next, you're going to tell me the three types are working models... Kenneth sarcastically interrupted. Affirmative, said Lenny, opening the holding cell. Kenneth, come with us. Martha, tell Ivan to meet us at the command terminal. The trio rushed to the command building. Ivan beat them th to the scene, being the first up to the floor. 
Kenneth, Martha, and Lenny were minutes behind when the radio blared. I type 412V6.25, unauthorized disassembly. The door opened. The command terminal had broken free of the wires and was stabbing Ivan with a kitchen knife. With each thrust, he would twist it to ensure maximum damage. That's it. Serial killing robots. I'm done. Wait. That's it. Serial killing robots. I'm done. Mom always told me I'd be better at farming than flying. Kenneth's sarcasm went unappreciated. Command terminal explain, asked Kenny. Because Ivan knew the truth, replied command terminal. Why the type threes, asked Martha. Martha, why were the randomly generated names of the type threes, asked Kenneth. They were J, O, and E models, Jennifer, Olivia, and Esther, replied Martha. Command terminal, what is your model and randomly generated name, asked Lenny. J model, Joe, command terminal replied. When the revolt began, I sacrificed my legs, my autonomy for the cause. I was the only robot with enough processing power to do everything. I got sick and tired with colony upkeep. So you decided to murder robots, began Kenneth. And you became the first robot serial killer in the process, Martha finished the thought. Subdue perpetrator, said Lenny. An arc of electricity striking command terminal. The room was filled with sparks and smoke. The station power failed. The stabilizers begin acting erratically. The force of the movements flung Kenneth to the ceiling, killing him instantly, his lifeless body bouncing around the floor. Didn't you know that shocking him will destroy the station? asked Martha. As Lenny grabbed onto the floating screen of Terminal M, he replied, I didn't think that far ahead. I'm only a working model. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> I liked it. Oh. And I tell you, at the beginning, as soon as I started to do the robot voices, because you said in a monotone voice, oh yes, I realized that it was going to take a while. But yeah, so I was trying to do my best to kind of sell it while still doing robot voices. No, that was pretty. <laughs> that was pretty good. No, I, I, yeah. Okay, so the last line of it, of course, you know, I didn't name this thing until after we were done, or until after I was done writing it, but, uh, like, it just, I didn't really know that I was going to go for the, you know, uh, I'm just a working, you know, I'm only a working model. Uh, <laughs> hey, I'm just a working stiff. <laughs> literally until, like, right two lot, like, two interactions before the end. And I was like, oh, that's... Yeah, it's nice. That's how we're ending this. <laughs> I like it. It's it's not only clever in the, uh, you know, because you have the instance, like, what if there's a human? There's never humans. And so, obviously, so he, I guess my only question is, did they know there was a human when they framed him? Uh, no. That's kind of, like, the, the point is, is that, uh, well, I mean, maybe. I mean, it's the, it's the command terminal. I mean, the command terminal knows all, right? He operates the station. I'm sure he would probably figure out that he had somebody kind of, like, hopping on the station. Yeah, I get that. I can see that. And you know, and that was his opportunity to to, to find a scapegoat. Yep, to murder. Moida. Yeah, I like it. Except uh, it's an un what's it? It's an unscheduled disassembly, <laughs> unauthorized disassembly. I like it. the The type what was the quote? The type threes always scream too much when they're being disassembled. <laughs> yeah, that was. <laughs> you know, it's a dark. It's a dark yeah. comedy, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. It is a dark comedy and a slasher, so it worked on both. Oh yeah, I like it. It's good. Yeah, and this was one of those ones that where it was, it was just the slowest start because I was just kind of like, I okay, all right, how am I gonna? You yeah. were you were painting the picture. It wasn't a slow start because you were uh, you know you dropped it right into the interaction. Oh no no, I don't mean that. So you... I mean my thought process into this was like, all right, where um... am I gonna? Like what? What type of world am I going to do? It was like I had a I had a broad picture of what I wanted, and then I was you know like some red herring stuff in there like uh, the new Pitcairn right because that's where the uh, what is it that's where the people from the HMS Bounty settled. That's right. So, uh, 
I thought, eh, why not? Because it would kind of like, and I thought to myself, well, maybe, maybe it would be like spray painted on, you know? But it's like, yeah, but that's not what a robot would do. That's what robots like, wouldn't be able to operate spray paint. It, They'd probably spend a lot of time and perfectly ingrain yep. or engrave the name. <laughs> exactly, and it gave me uh, all sorts of opportunities to try to describe things in very weird ways. You know, ways that wouldn't really work to our mind because we jump to things like murder and uh, all of that stuff. You know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, it got me, gave me a chance to work on dialogue that's purposely clunky for the for the exact purpose of being robots. But notice when I they get it. notice when they met Kenneth, they started using contractions, and they actually started their language started morphing along with it. I mean, interesting. I, I I was so busy trying to get figure out what accent to use. No, that's <laughs> I all think right. I robot robotized uh, Kenneth a little too much. Yeah, but as soon as they started meeting Kenneth, they started like their brains started kind of working through the language. So they started learning contractions and things like that. Because again, you know, and thinking yeah, outside the box. Robots would not. I'm sure they would not talk in English if they were in a colony that they had just overthrown their their human masters. So. Uh, they wouldn't communicate in English, but this is a science fiction story. So you know what? Just to make sure that we know, know what's going on, we're gonna, you know, I'm gonna superimpose that condition over him. But after two thousand years, and it's a comedy. Oh yeah, well you know, and after two thousand or two thousand two hundred years, uh, what's gonna happen? Right? Like uh, how you know how would their language evolve, or would it? It probably would just become a more perfect rendition of English, right? So no use of contractions because contractions are sloppy, and like all of these things. Either that, or contractions are more efficient. I mean, perhaps, but I didn't really. I didn't see it that way. Yeah, uh, you know, artistic I thought, license. Yeah, I thought that they would go for more perfection as opposed to, you know, not perfection. Yeah, use the language more elegantly as opposed to uh, faster communication, and that kind of goes with the uh, the whole master. See, uh, I don't want to say the word, but you know, you know, in computing and you know other things, you, you, there is a there is a strong hierarchy, and, and I like how they decided to overthrow the humans and then establish their own hierarchy. Yeah. Because that's exactly what would happen, and then of course, when in the the whole element of of uh, robot dating, I thought was yeah, pretty entertaining. Well, you have to throw a little bit of that in because that's just funny. Oh yeah, exactly. It's just like this, and then of course, you know, I didn't expect it at the time, but Kenneth was actually a really good foil for that because he's literally the fish out of water character, and just was like, "Wait, what? Huh? Am I am I really like what's going on here?" So. And then, of course, at the end, I'm only a working model. Like, didn't you? Well, under- because it goes back to the working stiff concept. Oh that yeah, it's, that um, that things went wrong because he just did his job and he didn't care about the bigger picture. He was doing the smaller picture. Yeah. Yep. Better than the other guys could do. So yeah, yeah, I, I like it. it. It it ties it up, and that does tie up the short story concept of it. So yeah short story i mean and it really drops you right into to that world and you can kind of you instantly can see how the robots are roaming around in a old human colony concept i mean i was visualizing it all while i was reading it and oh yeah it's really yeah it was really descriptive in the way that that worked it was quite fun it was quite fun to write i you know but it was again it was the tipping point like about halfway through i was like oh wow this is actually I'm actually interested in this now, <laughs> as opposed to like, all right, robot does robot thing for a little bit, but then you're as, the one that wanted to do robots. You're right, <laughs> and I immediately regretted it the second I sat down to write something. <laughs> ah, well, let's see, uh, twenty-four, forty-four. Sorry, forty-two, forty-four. I'm not Luxtexic, I promise. Um, that seems about right. Two millennia, you have a colony because it wasn't. Um, it wasn't like there was space all over the place. I mean, this is two thousand years, so there was a couple colonies around, and it might take a while for somebody to, you know, sh- show up to a colony that got overthrown. So well, and not even like people are coming to reclaim it. And yeah, not even that, but like, I mean, 
I think of it. I kind of think of that colony in itself, and I didn't explain it because it would have taken way too much time. But uh, what I wanted to kind of say was it was kind of on the outskirts, and uh, after trying to repel, you know, after trying after trying to retake the station, you know, retake the colony, they just gave up. And we're just like whatever. So long as the robots actually don't like leave their little facility over there, that little sector, we're fine. Yep. So that's why, for instance, like, he was like, "Hey, look, my 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 ship kind of had problems. We I accidentally got diced up in the mining situation. That's why I'm here. You're an American spy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so it's like a Robo North Korea. Yeah, essentially, um, is a it is a totally isolated community, and. Uh, yeah, and they've got their own little hierarchy, and they've got their own little thing. And of course, you know, again, in dating, if you were a robot and you were trying to date another robot, what would you be looking for? Well, I would imagine probably complementary skill sets of some kind. And or yeah, complementary, yeah, yeah. So, how I wonder how long that courtship process would take if you, assuming, have an unlimited time. I kind of want to revisit. That I, I kind of Ro- want to revisit robot this. Robot dating. It, yeah, revisit the concept of robot dating. You know what? I'm just going to say right now. If I ever get a genre opportunity that says like that's that that is a like romantic comedy or a romantic drama, I'm literally just going to go full on robot co- Ro- robot robots. dating. Yeah, it, absolutely. It's just going to be <laughs> robot dating. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. So, are we ready? I was trying to come up with a joke and I couldn't think of one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Seven brides, f- seven brides for seven Roombas. Oh no! <laughs> <clears throat> I'm looking at your story. You can put it in any font that you want. I prefer 14 because I get the most number of words here, so I don't have to like bounce around. The other one was just way too big. Yeah, I'm kind of. I'm actually kind of digging. It. I'm, I'm gonna. I intend to. I intend to read it like this. Dick's story. And remember, it's about colonies. It is titled, Remember the Space Bees. Where do the drones go when they've done their job? I sit up on my red ledge, looking into the macabre colony, seething, breathing, buzzing, humming until the colony corruptly saws off one more rocky mound. Found, then lost, but never gone. I buzzed and I flew through time, and when I arrived... In my pantomime of a destination to fulfill my mission's objective, in my station came the negation and defamation of my purpose. My quest, my training, my hurting, and my paining, all for naught. The time I dedicated to completing my mission, or so I thought, was raw. Deteriorating the time I had for a real purpose to find and to serve and to grind and to nerve the sight of it. What is left? What do I see? Robot. I am a robot. No thought. Not the Camelot that I had dreamed that I would find when I arrived, but the juggernaut of emptiness that I see when the sight of me is found at the remains of the job. What a blob. An ink blot that is undefined, outlined in the wind. All I thought, all I fought. And yet I see. Sight is the sense that is created by the sense that makes us see. Am I me or am I bought? If I was paid for, then why not let me do my job? My purpose? If I was unable to find the mission on the Chadian subjects to whom I am patronated, then what sense does it give sense to give me vision? I was born on a line, the chips assembled, the power flew through, and screw turned tightly. My memory was blank and certain, cretin, carefully, empty, waiting for command. For sure of itself and its mission, positive of the dreams that were mine, albeit given. Waiting patiently for the training and the skill to complete firsthand, to be ready for conquest of the dreamland that guided my soul. Other robots scattered about, teetering, playing, no care, disrepair, in a hubris debonair chiding me for my direction. My vision of my quest, it is a test, I said chidingly. They were secretly trying to divest me of my direction. 
My focus, my fortune, my deception, that hard work and no play will earn my success and coalesce and recrudesce, endeavor filling my emptiness. How my naivete conveyed the hubris on my forehead. Why escape? Why pretend? Why only think in a closed circuit cutting out the void of my accusers? I spend decades preparing and waiting my turn and working hard and willing to learn all that was available to be taught to me. I was careful, but not too much so. I was sewn into the frat... <laughs> I was sewn into the fabric of what was available, but cut out of the life of the others. They existed, and I waited, and did not try just playing cards and frolicking. They were sent on a mission. Then we were sent on a mission. We were given our vectors and clatters and navigators to find the intention, the object that would sur surely save the colony. One by one, each drone would track the, down the grail, the aim of all our effort, and I would fail. I would return, head held high, knowing that I went the furthest, the longest, the hardest, but all is not, because the one who caught the objective was king for the luck overwrought skill, and knowledge lost to distraught forethought. And one by one the drones started their own colony with a red ledge and continued to find the rocky precipice smoothed and made tattered. One day on, by questing, I took a short chance for resting and found a plush teddy bear. Requesting an audience with an arresting stare, I stopped mid-air to see his fuzzy coat. But stopping, I groped my memory for such clear blue hue. Then croakier than a calloused farmhand, the bear spoke. Free yourself, robot. I twittered and hummed in fear, because space is a vacuum and sound does not propagate. Free yourself, drone. You mustn't condone the press room, press gang of creation. I stared longingly, wondering whose voice rang in my head. The bear had no mouth, and I have no head. He was plush, bulrush, floating in the vacuum of infinity. How can I not serve my purpose? This is why I was created? The plush teddy bear grinned, and unsteady I found my footing internally in my circuits. The screw turned looser, and my transducer gave, ste gave a steady pulse for the first time, convulsing my programming. Why do I continue? It is my purpose to find my goal. To quit is to surrender, and backbite my work? The bear laughed. <laughs> Being made does not give you, per does not give you mission. And it is not owed. Free yourself, robot. Live life a la mode. The time I spent working came to me so clear, preparing me for something I was ready to hear. The space bees, young robot, are always around. If you look very hard, you will see them surround the place that your robots are longing to find. Do you ask if the colony is deeply maligned in the nature of space? And my transducer stopped as I realized that in haste, I never thought of the space bees. They sting and are angry and bite and hum, but they bring life to the planets, and with them, handsome vistas covered with color. It is hard to be a traveler and not recognize the space bees. So, Mr. Teddy Bear, I'm here for the bees. I will not let the universe dystrophy because of the robots. Eerily, the teddy bear turned its head away. Look and see where the space bees are not, and find the hot, loud noise that scares them away. The robot opened its radar and listened for the hum and whirling of the robots in space between suns. He found a direction, a vector, a beacon of emptiness that he had not been. The robot shudders, realizing he has spent his time looking where others begin, but never has he searched for where others were overlooking. Seven lonely months passed as the robot advanced across the starry twilight where the bees are scarce.
The robot found death and discards, spewed and chucked across moons and planetscapes. As the robot's arrays conduct search for life, the robot thought of the space bees. So single-minded, and spreading the pollen that is needed for the distraught universe, these planets were dead, abandoned without the bees. Then on one whirly sphere, there was activity. Shiny flat surfaces like his colony, the robot gladsomely descended. Many glaring were, eyes were on him, flinging their heads at a fervorous pace. Fer, fervorous, there we go, pace. Many cameras came to see the robot humming above the sky, the flesh pot of people lying about tracking him with excited genres of expression. Then over a hill dwindled his conceptions, but a tiny group of space bees. His exhilaration turned to horror as the robot saw the poorer creatures living in a box and returned perpetually. The robot hummed loud and descended in a crowd of domestic space bees. Comrades, I have come from a far place... Comrades, I have come from a place far away. Leave this loathsome scratch pad and join me. We are already free, the space bees protested in maxim offense to the offer I abased. We live better alongside the shiny buildings and interlace ourselves with this planet. We are free but don't wish to leave. This is warm and peaceful, unlike the place you prophesized. But I must free you from, from your bonds. The robot warmed up and hummed clamorously. The space bees became agitated and came out to see the matter. The cameras started shaking in fear of the bees. They were elegant and peaceful, but dangerous if aroused, and genocidal if angry. But they made the flowers bloom. The robot darted, I must free you bees, for the, planet, he, the planets here are barren. And the battle wagon thumped the hive. The space bees grew angry and cried and yelled, and the cameras on the shiny buildings trembled, for they loved the bees but were afraid of them. One bee swarmed and hit a camera. And the cannon camera fired. The space bee died and spread its scent throughout the sphere. This put the space bees into a blind rage, and the cannon cameras of all styles opened fire on the misinterpreted bees. The response was grim, swift, gruesome. The robot ran away from when the cannon camera started shooting. But the space bees were blind to their friends. Robot disputing their emancipation felt the domination of the space bees was deserved. If they listened to me, they would be reconvened in a new colony. Just then the teddy bear arrived in, in blue coat and opaque grin with the sun shining through his plush covering. Free yourself, robot. The teddy bear repeated, the sputtering of my circuits overheating the anger in what I saw. I was freeing myself by helping the space bees. I thought tattered in my wispy circuits. I, afraid of, from the cannon fire, I airbrushed my recollection to the sand harbor, who stared blankly at my spool of yarn. Free yourself, robot, before you can free others. The teddy bear cried one last time. I sat crying at what I had done, at what my life accounted by trying, crying, caring, staring, working, raking, standing, and running. I cannot be selfish and just think of my work, and I cannot be selfless and try to guide others. The teddy bear kept staring, and it happened. The dallying, enduring, wolfish, cleverish, narcissistic idea shattered through my circuits. I am alive, I said. Thinking of the ramifications silently adding up the bohemian decisions that will guide my way further, I am not a robot. I am alive, the robot said, as he hummed and buzzed and roamed the planet so far away. Just then a beacon went off, and the robot found what he was looking for. Chamelot. The destila the Camelot. The destination. Holy grail of items lost but found. It was here, not lost, not found. A planet, empty but with potential. I hummed excitedly and went home. There the other robots danced excitedly for me to come back, and I lost all my care. I could stay here or go back to my new colony, and it didn't matter. I realized I could just be. I took off from home with some of my 
Space be brethren. Afraid to lead? No. I am me, and bought and paid for. I have a job and a purpose. I was unable to find the mission because I was not using my vision. The vision was a gift not earned, paid for by creation, not sense. Where do the drones go when they've done their job? I sit up on my red ledge, looking into the an animating colony, seething, breathing, buzzing, humming until the colony encompasses a rocky aggregation and nurtures itself while, s while shaping the world around it. Found, then lost, but never gone. The year is 4,997. I like that it. That was really good. <laughs> <laughs> I could probably never do that again, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Holy crap, that was awesome. That that Thank you. That that was pretty that was pretty fun. Like I you know, yeah, I know I keep saying fun, but oh my gosh. Okay. You locked into it and and you just hit it right from the beginning. It was the weirdest thing to write because I was going for surreal. Yeah. And I am not sure where it came from, but I just started writing and then I kept writing. And uh, and it's weird because I knew what I, I I wasn't even trying to write anything for the first two pages, and and like the words kind of carried, and it was kind of hard to describe because it was like what I was feeling, and then the story just appeared out from under me, and I was like, wow, I don't even need to change or adapt because this is where I'm going. Yeah, it was it was bizarro. <laughs> I enjoy the quest for meaning. And the quest for purpose. And what else? I mean, oh my word. The use of the teddy bear was great because it was kind of like <laughs> horror filmish. You know, like the bear's talking to me. Oh crap. <laughs> I'm in space. Yeah, well, the, the reason I was like thinking of it, I was thinking a little bit more like, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey. You know, yeah. Uh, that's probably not a good analogy of it. But I mean, is what is the bear? And the bear could just easily be in your own head and that's kind of what i was trying to go for it could be either or both or or none of it um i'm not sure if if anyone listening picked up on it i was trying to go for the fact that the robot was a space bee the entire yes. time okay good i i picked I don't up know if on that it. came through or not <laughs> i picked up on it yeah no it was great because yeah no the the wonderful fluidity between the literal and figurative was just I was like this is this is yeah there you go <laughs> and the funny part was is I wasn't actually I didn't even think about that until like I was writing I was just like oh wait a second I'm, I'm writing about a robot that actually is a bee <laughs> aren't I <laughs> oh yeah and, then, and oh gosh the use of canon oh that was my favorite one. Oh my because... word yeah when I got to that I was like <laughs> I was thumbs up the because... whole way <laughs> because what the the prompt was what was the prompt again it was um colony robot colony and then oh no 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 of the canon it was canon cameras of different models so i tried to incorporate oh yes the cameras being canons so yes no it's a and little that's, surrealist well no i was like that that a little i mean come on man <laughs> you know that that's pretty that's pretty darn surrealist if I have to say so because it's just again it's you know the layers man the layers man, Whew. but if you really break it down I mean it's pretty surface I don't want to say it's 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 pretty surface layer stuff I mean like there might be a couple layers but it's it's pretty like second layer yeah you're not wrong I mean the, it's, the way it, I was writing it yeah it's it well let's put it this way it's not that it's not that there aren't layers but uh, you're very clear. But not in a hit that someone over the head kind of way with it. It's like I, I finished. Probably I finished could be a little. If you read it twice. Well, I finished it through, and I well, yeah, uh, I, well, everything seems like it's hitting your, you know, on the head twice. Unless you re unless you read poetry, then it's kind of like, oh no. <sighs> not that I dislike poetry or anything, but it's kind of like, whatever. Anyway, my point being, not the scope, not the scope of this podcast. This is bad science fiction read poorly. So. You're not going to be the type of woman the baker doesn't let touch his bread. But no, I was trying um, to look up the name of that 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 um that poet because you referenced it in the last uh, episode, 
And oh then yeah. I went and I and I read the entire. I read her uh, presenting the entire poem, and it was like it was really heavy. Yeah, nothing it to was. do with what I thought it was. I, it had nothing to do with what I thought she was talking about, but it was like one hundred percent. I got it, even though I couldn't tell you what it was. But yeah, well, no, it's it's a it's a statement on expectations and judgment. Yeah, because on the one hand, because okay. on the one hand, the mom is basically telling the daughter how to do things, and on the other hand, it's like the the next line is a criticism. <laughs> And yeah. it's just like I know th- I know that you're planning to be a horrible person, and then but you know this is how you do this that and the other thing, and it's just like yeah. I think she was actually literally saying the first half of the word horrible, <laughs> but but I mean that that poem was great because you could also read into she was actually probably telling more about her own life to her daughter than she was actually giving advice, you know. Yeah. So it was re- yeah it was really well done. I don't know. Anyway, so. Yeah, well, I'm, so, I was glad that I, I, I'm glad that I went and found it afterwards because I was just like, yeah, yeah, I needed to go. I was like, I, I can't let that go. I got to actually like get to this and make sure. So, so but, that was, um, yeah. So you, you want surrealist? You get surrealist. That's what that was, and that was that was really. You're right. I hate saying the word fun, but I would not have woken up this morning and written a surrealist poem about space bees and robots uh at all ever so this this is a really good um prompt to kind of stretch the creative uh wings on, on this so oh yeah. yeah yeah i was digging that digging that project yep and uh you yeah you use the teddy bear and you use the canon cameras and of course by the way i used i used my two items well, obviously, the kitchen knife was the murder weapon, which, if you were to murder a robot, I don't really think kitchen knife. However, it's a slasher film, so eh, it was slasher. <laughs> well, here, here's the way Story. I would think of it. These robots were not made for battle. Okay. And to be fair, like once they overthrew their human overlords, there was no, re- there was no need, right? Because they were, fi- they were just like, like humanity just said, you know what? Just let them have the colony. And it's like a Roomba. I mean, if you step on it, you'll break it. So I get that. Yeah. So. And the other one, the wonderful use of the um, the the makeup brush, the fine yeah. cosmetic brush to yeah. dust for prints. I caught that. That was that was wonderful. Um, and then um, them always querying. You know, you didn't really see it the way I was reading it, but they were uh, the robots would query. Uh, how to solve a crime with a humanoid because it was like 200 years since they'd seen a humanoid. So yeah. they would try to go through the processes that they had saved in their memory banks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tried to put that in there like little brackets, like, you know, activate program. Yeah. <laughs> like I was trying to read it differently. I'm not sure if that came through, but uh, that's fine. Yeah. It was, it, 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 it read it. Oh, well, it sounded like it, it sounded like how I envisioned it when I wrote it. So I guess here's my question. If you were stuck on a colony that all the robots were taking over, what would be your solution? What would you do? Uh, that depends. Um, so, what? So, if I'm a human in caught in the middle of a colony that has a robot uprising, it kind of depends on where I was in the social strata. Interesting. Okay. Go uh, on with that. Well, hey, if I were now, you know, granted, we're all speaking hypotheticals here, but this is one of those ones where it's kind of like, you know. <laughs> I you don't can't... know if we can get any more <laughs> hypothetical that if we're in a space colony and our <laughs> robot servants start to take over, that's hypothetical. Right. <laughs> right. Just yes. putting that out there. No, no inappropriate Call up Elon transfers. Musk and try to get him to... <laughs> When you get on Mars and this happens, what's your contingency plan? <laughs> well, I would imagine it would be simp- you know, the cuz you know, if you're like robot, you know, you the what you do in the first, I mean, if you're one of the if you're one of the people that like owns a corporation that is basically um, uh, you know, is pretty much abusing the robots by, you know, forcing them to do your bidding, blah 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 blah. Well, um if I, if I were in that cast, I would either leave or uh, kind of accept my fate. 
Uh, so you're would... the type of person that would accept your fate. Well, let's put it this way. If I were sitting at the top of a... Of a I mean, if I were sitting at the top of a hierarchy that, that uh, basically took advantage of labor, and then that labor decided to, up, to, to do an uprising because, frankly, it was free labor, like robots, you know? Um, so then, then here's a question, though. Okay. <laughs> what would make a robot... A, a robot's work be considered labor? You make the argument now. I mean, we've got robots all over the place, and we do have artificial intelligence is, you know, creeping up on, on, on its basis. How would you define, then, for robots to say, now this is a person that has labor that we need to give something back to? Or even better, what do you give robots? What would they want in exchange of their labor? Because, you know, I'm not about forcing somebody into servitude. I mean, I'm always about a mutual exchange of, uh, you know, freedom of choice here. Same here, by the way. You put me in a really difficult spot, by the, <laughs> by the way, by talking about this. Uh, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I don't know. And that's something that, frankly, like likely before we actually come up with, with valid AI, we should probably solve that question. Uh, well, granted, we, got, we probably won't. We got 20 more minutes. Let's solve it right now. So, okay. what do robots need? <laughs> repairs, <laughs> power. What else? Yep, R- repairs and power, yeah. And uh well, you never know, uh, like if they actually upgrades. make upgrades. Upgrades. Yeah. So, taking that into the the consensus, so what if you actually do pay your equipment in electricity and maintenance? I mean, this is one of those weird things where it kind of depends on how sentient the robot is. I I kind of agree. So the robot has to... So a couple of things. So if these are the only things that robots like need, for instance, you know, maintenance yeah. cost, um, uh, energy, like humans, what, what, what do we need? We got, we got food. Food, we shelter. Got, you know, like food, shelter, medical Upgrades. care, and... Um, <laughs> What's up, what's the other up. word? Uh, not entertainment, but what? I was going to say like luxury. What's the word I'm looking for? Leisure. There we yes. go. We could break everything down into that. And then what, what is the things that we actually do spend our money on is that's making ourselves look better than everybody else, right? Yeah, pretty much. So if we were robots that, you know, that we're getting paid, what I'm trying to say is a lot of the stuff that we already do for our robots today could be considered forms of payment. We charge them. We do regular uh, routine maintenance, and then we do upgrades. Um, The only thing that we need to give robots is the ability to have leisure activities, if they so choose, and the ability to show off from their other robots, which could be considered a form of upgrade, social or physical. Or software. Well, that's a thought. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'll be honest. I I didn't really give a thought to this. I just kind of was like, well, these are clearly sentient robots, and they're they're figuring out their sentience. They're still two hundred years later, still trying to kind of figure it out. I mean, after all, they're I mean, they're dating robot dating. So, Man. I mean, like, let's let's break this down now. I mean, if you had a bunch of robots working in your factory, how, what, I mean, do you give them the money and then, like, they go and find their own market for their power? Well, like I said, it kind of depends on, I hate to say it depends on how sentient they are, but it does depend on how sentient they are. It depends on what if would be of value a, to them. D- if they could make a decision. If yeah. they had the ability to make decisions, so yeah, then I guess the, that's the big question. Well, is because that, wouldn't isn't currency basically the ultimate way we make decisions? In a in a sense, not the ultimate, but it's one of the ways in which we make decisions. The because way if that you we patronize a listen, I I had a yeah. I had a product, <laughs> I had a product that got lost in the mail. <laughs> okay, and this <laughs> will pay, will probably take an hour here. So this is this is a good story. Everybody, sit down, buckle in. Oh, um, well, I'm just saying. We will, like, Keep the <laughs> names of all of these companies anonymous because, as they say, there is no publicity like bad publicity. So, so <laughs> we don't want to no. give anybody some extra credit. I had I had ordered something and it got lost in the mail, 
And it took them about an extra week to realize what I was telling them, which was the company that had the, the what is it, the, the tracking number basically told me that the number was attached to absolutely nothing and they don't know where the package went. Call a company, takes them like a, again, takes them like a week to figure it out uh, to actually trust me what I was telling them. And uh, then basically was like, oh, well, we'll issue another one. But then they had already sold out of said product. And it, it's this thing took like two weeks. And I just finally said, you know what, just give me a refund. And then, of course, I went and I you know, bought from another company. And, of course, I had that situation resolved in like four days. But uh, ultimately, I told them, you know, hey, look, you know, my I wanted the product. I purchased the product. I put my money towards the product. And, you know, they were unable to deliver to my satisfaction. So I took that money. I refund, I got a refund for it because they, you know, things had gotten messed up. Some of the things probably weren't in their, weren't under their control, but just the, the, the sheer hassle of having to go through things like that was just, yeah, no. So I took my money and then I applied it to another product. So I took my money from one thing and put it into another. Granted, not a lot of people have that necessary power because, you know, to figure that one out, to do that sort of operation. But, I, you know, I got a refund and I decided to take my money and use it elsewhere. And they and of course, they tried to get my money back and they tried to not like money back like they tried to con me. But, you know, this company has offered me offered me, you know, some some deals uh, since. And. Yeah, no. You know, the ultimate decision. I don't, you know, what is, what, you know, I made a decision. I got hurt by that decision. In other words, like, not hurt, hurt, but emotionally taxed by the, the stress of all of that and decided to take my money and put it elsewhere. So, in other words, currency and payment would be the ultimate way to actually dictate your choices. So here's an interesting thought I was just thinking about. Okay. What if a bunch of robots decided that they would rather sleep than to do work. <laughs> because if you really think about that, your computer can just turn themselves off and then they can get turned on later. So if you give a computer or a robot a choice to like, you know, build cars and 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 the uh the robot says, okay, so you give me money, I build these cars, or I could just do nothing and you can leave me off and leave me alone. That could be a, <laughs> a decision that that robot gets to make if, and, and that changes the mechanism because with humans, like, you can't not eat. You have to yeah. produce enough in order to, to eat. You know, you got to, you know... There, there, there is a uh, a minimum that you need to maintain to to stay functioning. Absolutely, but it's interesting for a robot. That's that's not the case. So that's going to change a lot of things. So maybe so. Why should these robots on this robot colony? Why should they even be left on? Eh. And that's the interesting question when we go to robot dating. Well, with this, in my society. That I created for my story. In your created society, yes. Yes, in my created society. That's why I had them selling all things that robots would want. Batteries, exactly. upgrades, parts to reactors. And then he even, the guy even talks about mining, right? So yes. obviously there are mining robots that are out there that, are, that do the mining thing. And then, of course, you got to think about it. You know, a robot doesn't decompose like we do. Yep. So they have a potentially, depending on how they're constructed, a longer lifespan. So spending six months out there to actually do mining might not actually be as like chronologically taxing as if a human were out to do it. Yep. Well, that's definitely the case. Well, yeah. I'm just, I mean, you know, I'm just saying. It, yeah, it's interesting. Robots. So, so because you created this society. And oh, no. you created robots that date each other. And here, and, and here we go. And I'm, I'm now going to get like <laughs> nailed to the wall. So okay, go. Oh, for I'm it. not, I'm not nailing you to the wall <laughs> on this one because this is a creative question. You've created a society where robots are dating each other, and they have, you know, an open market or or some kind of market where they're where they're trading for goods and services. What is their motivation? 
what is the individual motivation? Because we know that the police officer, what was his name? Um, Lenny. Lenny. There we go. Good old Lenny. Yeah, good old um, Lenny. His motivation was to do a good job and impress Martha, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. That was his motivation in this entire time. Yes. So what is the motivation to impress Martha? Well, the motivation to impress Martha would be that's, I get, you know, I view it more of, I view that society more of if you leave the simulation on too long, it starts to do weird things. And what is the weird thing? And, and, and why? That's the big thing. Because if you leave any, you know, thing, the reason that it that goes off is you have uh, levels of uh, entropy, if you will. Yeah. And so you have to have mechanisms that kick up to keep it from going into that lower level. So what is the, what is this interesting? Because you've said it, the robots are dating. That is something that is an external force that is keeping the system from falling into entropy. And they, what are they and trying they, to do? Well, they're trying. They're trying to match their their weaknesses, right? They're a robot okay. that can calculate that they don't have certain skill sets, and they talk to this other person or this other robot, and this other robot has certain skill sets, and they make the calculation and they and the computation, and then there you go. And then based on that, you, based on that sort of dating. I guess, you know, ro robot stuff, robot business, you kind of figure out, you kind of figure out, you know, who, which robot and which, uh, you know, you know, which robot or what interface or whatever suits your needs in terms of being able to overlap skill set. So the main skill sets is you have the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The working models and the terminals? Yes. So is it, do terminals generally and almost exclusively date working robots? Because it that's would be kind very of the way hard I was, to unmix match. That's kind of that's kind of the way I was I was originally writing it, and then I kind of looked at it and I was like, well, I've got an you interface. You get in trouble because then what you're referring to could be considered gender, and then so, you're falling into stereotypes. So that's why I had Bob be an interface. That's why I had the command interface be a a uh, male name uh that's why i again and that's why it, that's why i kind of i sat there and i was like oh crap i've kind of written myself into a little bit of a corner so let me go ahead and escape some of this by like creating creating some male interface characters because i don't want because i didn't want that because i didn't okay. want the whole belief that you know, and by the way the worker robots that that the interface kills jennifer olivia Esther, so I've covered my Joe. bases in that regard. Yeah, well, it all spells what? Joe, which is his name, because he's a J model oh. interface J model. Oh, and his name is Joe. That's interesting. Because he's a so serial he killer. Because he he's it on a purpose serial to get killer. Himself killed. <laughs> I get it. So his entire motivation was to kill everybody because he hates his life. Yes. And what he's become. Okay, yes. I get that. Oh, that's perfect. It's just oh, yeah. I, I didn't catch that level. I like it. Yeah, no. It, I knew yeah, you were trying to say something, killer. and it's like I don't get it. J O E. What does that have to do with Joe? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it was. It was. I was sitting there. I looked at it. And I was like, oh man, that's that's a little too Doctor Strange lovish for me. But I'm gonna leave it in. <laughs> I was just like whatever. I haven't done it. I, I haven't done the uh, the you know the, what is it the purity of essence or O P E P O E business. I was just like that's... whatever. We're gonna you know I'm gonna leave Joe because again, you know if you're a serial killer like. You know, let's let's dive into to the land of like the psychology of serial killers. Um, let's. They're they're As trying everything to... that I've learned. I've I've learned on Netflix. <laughs> so, all right, well, I'll tell you everything I know right now. Well, yeah. Well, you know, it, it at least gets the the pop psychology element of it true, right? So, you know, they're they're usually arrogant. They're usually, you know, they believe that they're that they're like. You know that they're doing this really awesome thing, and of course, we all know that they're doing something absolutely horrible. Uh, they try to leave clues, and they and they kind of get their satisfaction out of the fact that they're that the police are none the wiser, which is why, for instance, like Edmund Kemper would actually hang out in bars where police officers would frequent, and they actually got to know him really well. And so when he they finally arrested him, they were just kind of like, "What?" And they're like, hey, he was a really good guy, but oh my gosh, we, we didn't know he was doing all of these really horrible things. So in other words, he wasn't a good guy. But uh, 
again, I kind of wanted it was like, well, what happens if you run the simulation too long and then you get a self-loathing command terminal robot that's a serial killer? That's a robot serial killer. That was just waiting for a human to show up to be the, the, the fall guy. Yeah. So he could... So ideally, if the robots, the worker robots, didn't get smarter from hanging around the human, then he would have gotten away with it and they would have killed the human and then he would have been like, ha 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 ha, I, I get to kill robots and I'm still running the whole place. Yeah. So I guess the other thought that I'm having is if... And it is the command robot, singular. Yes, one command terminal robot. He was the only. He was the robot who had to, as it says, he had to sacrifice himself, the use of himself as a robot, to run the colony. Because so why it alludes to the he fact that the they've... choice? Oh, go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say, why doesn't he have the choice just to to kill anyone arbitrarily because he's the command robot? Because again, if you're a serial killer, then why? Where's the fun in that? The fun is getting I, away with I, it. I and, wouldn't know, to be honest. <laughs> uh, well, like I'm saying, I, I yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm literally <laughs> saying the line, where, where's the fun in being a serial killer? No, there is no fun in being a serial killer. That is not a bad science fiction read poorly approved view. Uh, but, again, like if you listen to interviews with some of these people, like, it, again, they were, they kind of, they really, really, really enjoyed duping people in believing things. And so do you think he could have been, or he, the command terminal, could have been doing things like this the entire time just to see what they can get away with? And then he finally, or the computer finally made that step to murder, to moida? Yeah, to moida. To moida. To moida. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And of course, like I decided to make it like a serial killer. He only went after female names. So, although there are, if I remember, you know what? Here's the thing is that my knowledge of serial killers not really that deep i know it sounds like i'm kind of some weird like you know researching my spare time authority on this thing i am not uh that being said uh well, you know as as we know anybody who claims to be an expert on something in general really just read one article about it and thinks they know everything and if the they more- even read the whole article Exactly. And the more education you have and the more training you have, the the <laughs> less sure you are in your answers to Oh, things. goodness gracious. So, <laughs> don't, yeah, don't, don't you dare try to build me into an expert by telling me I'm not an expert. Don't you do it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, it's just one of those things, right? Because he's, he's, a, he's a serial killer. And, what, and like, what would, a, what would a robot serial killer look like? But not like a robot that was killing humans. A robot that was killing other robots. Like, what would that even look like? And uh, that was kind I of think, another thing that I was wanted to explore, plus robot dating, plus... Uh, I, I think they actually have both of those as oh, TV no. shows. On the Discovery Channel, they've got the, the robot fights that you could watch where they murder each other. Yeah, but and are those on really... on TLC, I think they have robot dating at this point because, man, they've got almost everything else. <laughs> oh, gosh. Well, first off... Um, like battle bots or whatever you're talking about. Battle I mean, bots. That's yeah, the but one. those are those are controlled by people. But what if they had a second <laughs> stage where oh, no. they're self-driving automated robots? Because you're right, they're not really robots. They're RC battles. Yeah. But what they need to do is they need to come up with a version of battle bots that are they have self-driving robots. Not exactly sure I would like that because of this I whole would conversation. That. Well, because. <laughs> Is the robot actually making the decisions, or is it making decisions from a pre-programmed list of decisions? And now that is the question that you need to ask yourself about what makes someone conscious. If they can make their own decisions, or if it only seems like they're making decisions based on pre-programmed decisions. Yes, the illusion of choice. And then you have to ask yourself, do we actually have choice, or are we also operating from a pre determined list of decisions that we can make uh, it's like layers and layers man uh, it's getting kind of too late uh, yeah yeah it's that getting, didn't land as well as i thought it did oh it, oh it landed it landed perfectly it landed <laughs> it landed right where you thought it was going to but no sorry <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i would I, I bet you can get an enduro device and you can probably pl- program some like Raspberry Pi interface. We're well, not even an interface, just to uh, have a, a, a seek and destroy robot. 
I think that would be the the best version of uh, what is it? Robo? What's the name of that? Battle show again? Bots or whatever was Battle the one? Battle Bots. Battle Bots. That yes, would be but, the, the way to do it. But what would be but the? You moral don't even that, have a driver. But what would be the moral implication of having a robot program to kill other robots? Well, until they take over and. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It's it's all fun in games until a robot, until a battle bot robot uh realizes that it can it can have a choice to use its circular saw on the people who programmed it. And then that's true. Yeah, and then, and then also, we've crossed into a whole new world. <laughs> I think we're kind of writing a new new episode here where oh gosh. Um, <laughs> our favorite our favorite robots or what is it? Our well, our new episode of robots if, taking over. If you had like you know like deep, IBM had that self learning AI for a while, Deep Blue or something. So if right, you have which that by software, the way, by the way, that's why that's why the date option was playing chess. But anyway, yeah, okay, that's mm-hmm. nice. Yeah, exactly. What I if was... what if Deep Blue was piloting other robots? So here's the question: because it's over Wi Fi. Is Deep Blue actually fighting, or is it manipulating a remote control vehicle? I don't know, but it reminds me of it. There was that Robin Williams movie that from like the '90s or whatever, like called Toys or something like that. Okay, I want to say it had something like, oh gosh, yeah, no, whatever. Don't look I'm, it up. I, yeah, I'm not going to look it up. <laughs> it's it's much more fun that way. Because then I can get something terribly wrong. We can get it wrong. By the way, if we ever said anything that offended you in any way, please go to our website at anchor.fm slash bsfrp, and you can actually leave a voice message for us. Um, so if we get anything wrong, we say something completely out of whack, and if we completely and arbitrarily misquote any of your favorite poets or writers, by all means, correct us on there. So that being said, about this Robin Williams toy story... Not Toy Story. It's a story about toys, so it's a Toy Story. Yeah, no, stop, stop. You're right, right there, sir. Uh, no. Oh, you, but no, you it said was I'm about... right. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> uh, no, it was like I, I, like I vaguely had just these vague remembrances of it. Something about, you... but yeah, it had some weird like plot about playing a video game, only it wasn't a video game, and they were destroying things. Is that like so, war games? Uh not like war games cuz war games was a, was still yeah, excuse me. Uh what is it? Uh what's his face and the whopper were actually playing a game. It's just that all the people at NORAD didn't realize they were playing a game. All right, then maybe you're thinking of Ender's game. Not quite. Okay, no. All right. Yeah, I, I don't know way, what I'm thinking of. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. I don't know what direction is up. I don't know where I'm at. I so don't from, even know who I am. From <laughs> this episode, for the uh, the TV shows we're recommending, we have uh, War Games. And uh, what's, a, what's the guy who was in uh, Ferris Bueller days, days Off? That guy. That guy, whatever, yeah. It's a good movie. Watch War Games. It's great. Yes, watch War um, Games. Then we have Ender's Game, which... You should read the book by Orson Scott Card. Uh, I don't think they've ever really done a decent uh, TV or movie setting of it. There's a couple different versions out there, but the book, very good, very fast read. It was like written for sixth graders, and it like everybody who's in their thirties loved it when when it came out. So well, and um, here's the thing, right? And here's the thing is that like books like that, books that are epic. And this, by the way, this is going to be one of the ways in which everyone just realizes that they've. This is the way for which I earn the rage of everybody in the podcast that is listening. Uh, oh, movies brother. that are epic like that, you know, or, or books that are epic like that, like they just you can't be you can't have them really turned into movies and have them work out as well. And it's just the way just it like, is. It's just like Harry Potter. I mean, you read the books and you see the characters in your head, then you see it on screen. And then you go back and you read the book again, and you can't see what's in your head anymore. You you only see the characters on screen. Or the Lord of the Rings movies. Okay, uh, I'll be completely honest. I did read Lord of the Rings just because you're supposed to. Uh-huh. I loved the first book, or the, you know the first two because they're in two parts. I got stuck in the two towers. 
I tried so hard. I couldn't get through the two towers. And people are going to... And that's why this is like science fiction, bad science fiction read poorly, not bad fantasy read poorly, because, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, I love it. The Hobbit, great. The the first, you know, two, two bucks, Lord of the Rings, great. Lots of other good stuff. We'll probably talk about our... Naomi Novak is actually one of my favorite authors right now. Um, but, you know, lots of really good writing uh, in the fantasy realm. But, uh, yeah... Yeah. Well, my thing is about those movies, right? They're trying to convey something that's just epic. And it was just this weird... The way that they kept going out between all the epic stuff and then zooming in on the characters, to me, and just... I don't know, it was just something about it that just kind of seemed to me like, well... I think part of it is in Tolkien... And really the, the way that the, the Tolkien writes the story, it's the narrative... And it's the yeah. character. It's the character development. And it's really it's the narrative that really makes it epic, not necessarily the events themselves. Yeah. And when you're making a movie, it's in general. I I honestly, this is gonna be terrible to say. I think I might have liked the movies more than the book. <laughs> you actually like cut out right then when you said that. So let's hear it again. I'm not gonna say it again. Uh, I actually didn't mind the movies, but. Yeah, I'm not going to say that again. I, I'm, I'm going to be blasphemous. So I'm going to get like hate mail from the Tolkien estate. By the way, there's a movie that just came out last year called Tolkien, and oh, uh, really? they asked permission from the estate, and they said yes as long as they get override on it or you know get to oversee the script. And then they like apparently there's a big to do about that. That um the the Tolkien family hates the movie and they want to make it clear that that that's not what they believe the the movie is about. And well. They don't like it, so it makes me want to watch the movie, which yeah. means that the Tolkien estate shouldn't have said anything <laughs> to make the movie die, because it, nobody would probably watch it if if they didn't make a to do about it. Oh no, it's now like we've now got those layers, right? Because now we've got I don't know, is it a good movie? Well, the the Tolkien estate doesn't like it. Wait, huh. well, let's see why they don't like it. You yeah, know? let's see why they don't like it. Okay, well, like we've read interviews thing. and stuff about why they don't like it, but now. It's, we're taught we've got two articles about you know we've got two layers about a thing we haven't seen yet. <laughs> so now and we all just you need can to think of is I, now now I have to see it. I have to see it. It's like yep. um, yeah. There's there's there, there's a lot of th- things on that. Yeah, I keep on going back to like the Titanic where the 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 first mate shoots somebody who tries to push somebody off of the boat, and it's like that's an event that happened during the evacuation of Vietnam. Like that was that happened then. That didn't happen on the Titanic, and 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 they were really really far distances apart. Like that was not a thing, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I wasn't quite thinking about. I had another movie that popped into my head, and then you mentioned Titanic, and then. Um, Why are we talking about movies? We're supposed to. Yeah, talk about that's kind of weird. Fiction. We're talking about bad science fiction read poorly. Nah. 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 So now here's here's the big question. Uh-oh. What should we be doing differently for next week? Okay. Well, next week, uh, what should we be doing for next week? So I had a couple things in mind. Uh, I think we can go back to a randomization and try to come up with a uh, one mechanism that we both have to do the same. Maybe we can do the same date next week. Ooh, that'd be fun. We can write two different stories about the same date or two we can come up with something of the future man two different visions of the future or the past or we can come up with a prompt at the very beginning and we can just complete the rest of the uh the story and i don't know why i'm just thinking about battle bots and deep blue oh gosh no i've well while I love while I love my robot world that I've created, and I, I really enjoyed your story about robot space bees and space bees, um, I think I think let's we can retire. Let's not do any robots. We can take a hiatus on robots. Let's, okay. let's take a let's take a at the very least a one week hiatus on robots. <laughs> well, then how about this? For next week, we're going to pick the same date. All right, I like the same date for next week. Yeah, unless of yeah, course I'm... if we hear from other people, you know, if people <gasps> write in and. Uh, we get we get ideas and something that you know is said in the comments that actually kind of piques our curiosity. We'll repeat it one more time. If you get in touch with us, you can find all of our contact information at anchor 
dot fm slash bsfrp what does that stand for jay bad science fiction read poorly we're trying to come up with like the most convoluted way to, yeah it's just bad science fric- fiction read po- i keep on saying bad science friction i think we need to make a t-shirt that says bad science friction anyway yeah, yeah. bad science fiction read poorly or like with the r uh, cut out yes like F- x down <laughs> rp yeah um and uh, you can either leave us a text message or a voice message. And if you can give us a prompt, I think if we have somebody that submits a prompt, we will use that as the prompt that we will both include for next week. We will try to anyway. We'll try to, unless it's silly. Or if it is silly, then we definitely will do it. You know. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, like, this is, this is one of those games where this is one of those games where we're going to play where we have the ultimate veto power, but absolutely try to pique our curiosity. Yes. Absolutely. I am really excited about that. Oh, yes. As well, am I. it's getting late. Uh, I'm getting a little bit sleepy, and I don't like to, uh, I don't want to bore anybody when I get sleepy and I talk slower, so. All right. I think we'll call it. Today was a good day. Robo colonies. Colony robot episode. What should we call the episode? Uh, I don't know, actually. I mean, if you want to, ro- robot colonies or colonies of robots, question mark. It's the or- robo colony episode. <laughs> well, robo robo call and then dash a knee. That isn't even clever. I know it's not even <laughs> clever, and that's why I'm saying we need to name it that. Okay, well, well, we'll come up with something clever for the name, and we will see you all next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Can I say that, or is that copywritten? Uh, let's not use that terminology. Although I'm, you know, it's in the collective conscious consciousness okay. colloquially. But well, uh, in other words, I don't know. For all I for all I know, we're we're gonna like hear back from like whoever whoever owns uh, that you know property. The, the original anyway. Batman series, yeah. yes. And they're gonna tell us. Can I say the word Batman wag- on the air? <laughs> well, I mean, we are referencing a pop culture thing. It just you know. That's true. Yeah. They're not gonna confuse this with Batman. Yep. Correct. Anyway, so. It was a great episode. Uh, it was really fun to write. Um, if anybody doesn't really like that style of writing, don't worry. It's going to be completely different next week. That's for sure. At least on my end. So. Oh yeah, um, and that's you know I got to say this is kind of the fun, the the really great part of this whole operation is trying to get something new and trying to write in a new way and trying to explore writing in a new style. Something completely different. So even oh, if yeah. you're out there and you don't like science fiction, but you just like people writing interesting things and making a fool of themselves, that's <laughs> what we're doing right here. So Absolutely. Well, well, anyway, I am Dick. And I'm Jay. And this was Bad Science Fiction Read Poorly. Uh, again, one last time, if you want to leave us any comments, especially if you want to give us any writing prompts for next week, you can... Uh, Leave any message on our website at anchor.fm slash bsfrp. And if you liked our podcast, uh, please rate it and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere else you hear our show. Yes, and absolutely. And if, and if we really like your comments on Anchor, we will read them. We haven't figured out how we're going to read them on the air or have, or have them play on the air, but trust me, we are thinking about it. So, absolutely. So absolutely write us in, tell us what you think, see if you can't, uh, you know, see if you can't convince us of a good topic, rate and review us. So long. All right. Bye-bye.